Okay, so it's recording now. So let me just uh, start by introducing myself. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Nicolas. I'm a market analyst here at, at Codific, working uh, sales and also in the SEO efforts. I also helped a little bit uh, with the development of the new attendance reader app. Um, I'm from Peru and I study at Erasmus University in Rotterdam. Um, thank you very much for being here. I'm super excited about th having the chance to interview both of you guys about privacy threat modeling. So firstly, I just wanted to ask, um, could you tell us about yourself and your expertise in privacy threat modeling? Maybe uh, Kim can start. Sure. Um, so I'm Kim Watts. I'm a researcher at uh, the Distrinet group at KU Leuve, and I've been working there in the area of security engineering, privacy engineering, and privacy threat modeling for, I have to count, more than 15 years now. Um, I am one of the creators of uh, Linden, a privacy threat modeling approach, and I've been working on um, extending, updating, uh, maintaining it ever since. And I'm Adam Hofsepian, and I'm the founder and CEO of Codific. Uh, before jumping into this entrepreneurial adventure, I was a researcher at the same place at Distinet K. Leuven, which is a world-class research lab uh, in the domains of security and privacy. And I was working on security and privacy engineering. And amongst a couple of other topics, my research focused on security and mainly privacy threat modeling. I was also working on Linden, on the more pragmatic side of it, and whether intentionally or not, security and privacy have been baked into Codefix DNA. And we are very happy about it. Yeah, I, I definitely can can see that. Um, okay, so next question is: In simple terms, uh, what is privacy threat modeling, and why is it important? Okay. I, I can start maybe, and Aram, yeah. you can do some additions from the field. Um, so threat modeling in general means that you think upfront about the things that can go wrong from a security or a privacy perspective. So you can fix it early in the development life cycle because, well, it's, it's, it's proven that it's more cost efficient to fix it early than to fix it late when it's already implemented. And so... It's a well-known approach in the security community, but it's equally useful um, in the privacy community. Um, I think it's important to note that privacy is not a synonym for confidentiality, which people think privacy is much broader. So next to security, we need also a focus on privacy. We need to think of, do we really need those data? Can we use those data? Um, can we minimize the information? Can we minimize the processing? And what is all the stuff that can go wrong related to that? Uh, okay, that, that's a great start, actually. I want to take that to the next level and look at it from the organizational perspective. So basically, threat modeling, uh, again, like Kim said, it's about finding things that can go wrong and that can have a harmful uh, impact or outcome for your software system or your organization. And all that is uh, provides a valuable input to risk assessment and risk management. And risk is, or well, it should be, it absolutely should be a central concept in any organization's realities when it comes to security. Because there are millions of things that can go wrong and risk and risk score will help you figure out, okay, which of these am I going to focus on? And uh, just to give a small analogy in human language for people who don't to, to, for people to give the chance to relate a little bit more. Last week, I was at the OWASP SAM Summit, uh, which was in Boston, and my flight was from Amsterdam. And I live in Leuven, uh, which is about two hours driving and three hours by public transportation to get there. And obviously, like everybody, uh, any human being, uh, I don't like missing my flights. And I had basically two options to, to get there. One was driving. And in order to miss my flight, or actually not to miss my flight, uh, what I, I, situations that could have led me missing my flight are obviously my car breaking down or running out of fuel uh, or having a flat tire. And on the other side, also traffic jams. Morning traffic is, is killing in Belgium and the Netherlands, uh, which means that I had to take to make sure that I leave 
uh, with some mar extra hour of margin, for instance, and make sure that my car has fuel and my car is regularly maintained. So breaking down was not really uh, a big concern. Uh, the other uh, possibility was taking, taking the public transportation, uh, which is uh, taking a bus to the Leuven station, then taking a train to Antwerp and then taking a train to Amsterdam. And given that cha those chain of things, I had to think like, okay, which bus should I take? It was an early morning flight, by the way. So which bus should I take to make sure that I make the train? And then ideally you want to take a bus, you want to have a one bus of uh, margin. So you don't take the bus that makes you to the train, you take the bus before that. Uh, and then unfortunately the train from Leuven to Antwerp was the first train. So there was no margin there. But then if I would miss that train or if that train was delayed, uh, the train to Amsterdam, there was a second train which would give me enough time just to make it uh, with some comfortable margin for the flight. And this is what I'm telling you now is, is thread modeling in, in real life. Basically, everybody thread models all the time, probably. Well, yeah. ideally, you should, you should thread model every time you're taking a, a flight, make sure that you don't miss it. Yeah, yeah. So we do it every day anyways, but without really realizing we're thinking it through. So it makes so much sense to also do that explicitly when we're building systems, when we're building products to think about the security and the privacy stuff that can go wrong as well. Yeah. So did you end up taking the bus and the train? or I the took car? the bus and the train, yeah. Okay. And then yeah. it was way before, before <laughs> the flight in, uh, there. So yeah. Yeah, well, I could have taken like three trains later and still make it. <laughs> yeah, but still better safe than sorry. So it's the it's the thread yeah. modeling habit, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That that was a super interesting analogy. Actually, I had not, never thought of it in that way before. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 good that you arrived quite early because that particular airport has a lot of problems right now. Um, the Schiphol Airport. Um, but yeah. So the next question is uh, a little bit more about the process. So can you explain the process of modeling the threats to privacy? So, for example, what are the different steps that are usually need to be taken? I understand, obviously, this process is very different depending on the organization, on the product, on a whole variety of different things. But in general, what are the, the different steps that you usually take? Sure. Um, do I, will you? Yeah, yeah, you can start, Kim. Okay, I, I will continue with uh, Aram's analogy of, of getting to the airport, maybe. So, um, well, basically, there's four steps, four questions. Um, they were coined by Adam Shostek, who wrote like the Bible on threat modeling. And it's uh, what are we working on? What can go wrong? What are we going to do about it? And um, did we do a good enough job? So the first thing is um, you, you visualize what you're working on. So you need to have a model of the system. In, in the scenario of uh, going to the airport, it's kind of visualizing the entire uh, trajectory of getting from Aram's home uh, to the airport. Um, and then the next step is what can go wrong. So clearly he didn't want to, to get there late. Um, so um, he was thinking of all the things that can, he just explained it. So I'm re-explaining his scenario where I had no part in, but like, the bus uh, running late, the uh, train being cancelled or getting some delay. That's all the stuff that you can think of up front that can go wrong. And then how will you fix it? How will you mitigate it? Well, you take some, um, some additional um, time, you take a backup train and so on. And the same applies to security and privacy threat modeling. You start with the, the, the model of the system and then you go over each of the interactions of the elements there and you think what can go wrong from a security or from a privacy perspective. The tricky thing is that, well, in this example of the trains, we all know what can happen. Trains run late, get cancelled. But from a security and a privacy perspective, it's less obvious. You need to be an expert. Um, you need to have a lot of experience. Uh, the good thing is that there are, there are approaches such as Stride for security and Linden for privacy that bring this knowledge into the picture as, as a, an approach, as a process. So Stride has a lot of information on security issues that can go wrong, that are known. Linden does the same from a privacy perspective. By the way, Stride and uh, Linden are actually also acronyms for the different security and privacy categories 
for which they also provide information. So from the Linden perspective, it's linking, identifying, non-repudiation, detecting, um, this uh, data disclosure, unawareness and non-compliance. So in these categories, that approach provides information on what can go wrong. And then that information, that knowledge can be used to analyze the specific system and determine all this stuff that can go wrong, does it apply to my specific system? And then in the next steps, you can you can further mitigate that. Um, Aram, feel free to. Uh, I, I think I think you yeah you really really covered everything. I just want to <laughs> throw in some tribe knowledge or some uh, fun facts that uh, a bad threat model is still way better than no threat model. And typically, if you are a starting threat modeler. First of all, it is for an organization, you should probably uh, invite an expert because it could be challenging to do it. Um, on the other hand, you could also take various uh, courses, uh, sorry, trainings that are often organized with large security conferences like Black Hat, uh, all OWASP conferences and so on. Um, and yeah, I, I would say that, that the first, at the, at the lowest level of expertise, Threat modeling, you would just go through the mnemonics like Stride and Linden and try try to come up with threats based on those. And the further you mature, uh, the more advanced uh, strategies you can use. And of course, the, the expertise and, and an expert will come up with threats just like that versus somebody who uh, has no experience in threat modeling. He, he might not be very quick. Uh, it might take him more time. Yeah, yeah, it might sound overwhelming, especially if you read like the information on how to apply Stride or how to apply Linden. And ideally, you spend a lot of time actually um, analyzing the system, which can be for people getting started like, I don't have the time, I cannot invest that much in it. But as Aram says, even th the slightest additional effort you can do, even if you start with just 15 minutes of brainstorming and, and thinking of security and privacy issues there, it's already much better than not considering it at all. So build it up and, and go from, from uh, tiny efforts to a, a, a well-integrated um, threat modeling program or, or practice. And, and by the way, we are mentioning now, you should do it, you should do it, you in a sense of the team, so yeah. that threat modeling should happen in a, in a group where at least your security, arch, your software architects are on board, your security champions, your development team. You can invite a lot, a lot of different kind of stakeholders, but those should be definitely in there. Your QA could as well participate. And actually, we, we did one, uh, we did a recent, uh, the recent threat modeling uh, exercise we did uh, recently. Uh, our QA uh, came up with quite some interesting threats which nobody could think of. Um. Yeah, and a side effect of having all those people around the table, which we hear a lot from other companies, is that that first step of threat modeling, knowing what you're working on, that system model, that, that joint understanding of the system, is often something that is new to, to those organizations because all those different um, profiles, they know bits and pieces, but getting that big picture and getting a, a mutual understanding, a mutual view on the system seems to be something that was not there yet. So in addition to having that great analysis of security and privacy, you get that joint understanding of the system and, and people really coming together and discuss that, so. Yeah. Yeah, well, that, that's definitely quite a uh, elaborate process. I understand, obviously, um, as, as Aram mentions, for example, the expertise you have obviously plays a big role in it. Uh, just just a, a bit of a follow up question before we move on to the next uh, main question. Um, you were mentioning that it's important to do it as a team, right? Because then you have multiple th people thinking about uh, the, pro the possible threats to privacy um, and it's in general, more more so in, in the case of, of big organizations, it's usually also a good practice to consult like external, um, for example, an external consultancy firm that also does privacy threat modeling. It's usually a good idea to also get other people maybe that are not from your organization, but from uh, external sources to also try and do privacy threat modeling in your organization. 
or is it usually better to just keep it within within the walls of of your of your company? Um, go ahead. I would say that uh, if if you have no experience in thread modeling, you should probably invite an external uh, expert who will then moderate and help you thread model. But in terms of once you have that process set up, once your uh, let's say your security champions have mastered thread modeling and are thread modeling experts, um, I, I don't think that an external party will be of much help because they are also not are, are unlikely to understand your system as good as your own team does. Yeah, I, I agree. I was also thinking of in in the first phase setting it up. It's it's useful to have somebody there, but the end goal is to to do it yourself and have security champions, privacy champions fill that that role there. Yeah. 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 Okay. Makes sense. Um, okay. So moving on to the next question. This um, this is how does threat modeling relate to other security related activities? Uh, so for example, um, when we were coming up with the questions, uh, we were thinking also about, for example, the SAM framework where it's basically an idea of how how you have different areas of your company and how you you can improve the cybersecurity in all these in all these different areas so how for example can privacy threat modeling help do this um in, yeah maybe uh, ram can start in this question yeah uh you mentioned sam so i i will piggyback on that um well sam is a um Maturity framework, security maturity uh, framework, and security assurance program uh, that um, that allows any organization to first of all measure where they are in terms of security posture, and then formulate a strategy uh, that consists of small improvements over time, and then demonstrate and uh, demonstrate that growth and that those improvements. And SAM covers all areas in the software development lifecycle, including design, where thread modeling largely is situated. So thread modeling, I would say thread modeling covers a lot of, uh, a lot of possible security issues or improvements or activities in that design phase. But from SAM perspective, there are about 90 activities, security-related activities in uh, application security program during the development of an application, of a software application. Uh, and thread modeling covers, in its most advanced version, probably uh, 10 out of the, those 90 activities. So it's it's a great start, but it's still about 10% of what you should be doing if you want to be a security champion. Of course, you don't have to be doing all those 90 activities because you need to start from something I mentioned earlier. What is your risk appetite and what is your risk profile and what is what is risk how important uh, are uh, security issues throughout your, given your organization and your software system. Um, but I would say that threat modeling should come back in most of organizations and most software developments. And I, I think it really makes a difference between a, a pro in terms of, of a software firm and team versus amateurs and wannabes. Uh, unfortunately, uh, according to BSIM benchmark, uh, which is BSIM is is a an alternative assurance program to SAM. Um, according to their study, only 16 out of 132 firms out there are doing some form of threat modeling, not the most advanced, but some form. And I've also spoken with some practitioners, uh, uh, which is highly not statistical data, but they also agree that. One to ten percent of of software firms and teams are doing threat modeling out there. Um, that's not that's not great. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I I, I just like to add on to this. Um, you mentioned it's like one of the I forgot already how many activities within the the, the some framework and the development life cycle. So indeed, it's situated early in in that design phase, but it's it's just important to highlight highlight once again that it should not just be seen as that one activity in an isolated box. The goal is not to just write a document and say, look, we spent two hours or five hours or whatever, and this is like the, the 10 most important threats we came up with. The, the, the usefulness of threat modeling is then using that information 
and using that as input for the subsequent uh, phases to really use that and and make the system better, more secure, more privacy aware. And um, it's even I think there's one uh, one of the the NIST uh, recommendations on I forgot which one, but it it mentions to have threat modeling also used as input for the the final testing because when you know what you want to avoid and you should also once it's already implemented see whether the system actually fulfills that that requirement so yes it's probably just one of those activities but it has an impact on on other activities as well or it should at least yeah actually i, I wanted to add to that that indeed threat modeling should is not something you do and you give it as a paper to to the management but the outcome of threat modeling should be a list of threats and then based on those on that list you should definitely document that list in some tracking uh, system or or, uh, or an issue track an issue tracking system for instance and then you should prioritize some of those threats and keep others maybe in a backlog eventually like also Kim said you should be also you can do more things with those threats first of all you can solve them but you can also design security regression tests, which will then check if that threat is uh, correctly solved and if it's maybe regressing, uh, whether that's automatable or not, that doesn't matter much. You can also have a QA who will have to look at it every time the system, uh, a new release is, is being added. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, uh, okay. Yeah, so so from what I understand, it's it's very much uh, within the privacy threat modeling is very much within the initial phases, right? In the design phase, but however, it should be applied still throughout the process, especially when testing testing the system as well, just to ensure that that the threats are actually uh, dealt with. Um, I'm talking a bit about a bit about uh, applying privacy threat modeling. Um, I know you both helped in the development of the Lindum privacy privacy threat modeling uh, methodology. Uh, I understand it's a very important methodology and it was even introduced in the NIST, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so could you maybe explain what it is and what it's used for and maybe examples of, of where it's used in the industry already? Um, yeah. Sure. Um, so it was created, again, I have to count, I think 12 years ago, uh, and we've uh, updated it a, a couple of times. We're actually working on, a, on an update now, so stay tuned. Uh, we will soon release uh, some more information. So the, the, the idea is, actually, the, the origin story is we, we've been working on a, um, a research project. We've uh, We were responsible for the security analysis, so we've applied Stride. And then we collaborated with people for the privacy analysis. And well, we realized in the field of privacy, there is no such thing as privacy threat modeling back then. So that made us wonder like, how can we help here? So we, we looked at what we like about Stride and we um, um, well updated that for privacy as well and we've been doing that ever since so the idea is that we stick to the the same four questions that we men mentioned before um but that we introduce their privacy knowledge on privacy concerns on privacy issues on um suggestions for privacy mitigations and we bundle that according to the um seven linden categories which are linking identifying and so on um we um, started with, again, in line with Stride, with some uh, threat trees that capture all that knowledge, uh, the, 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 the threat um, issues, um, the threat types. Um, but we, we noticed that, well, as Aram mentioned earlier, people will get started with just brainstorming about the high level categories. And that's great, but you need a lot of expertise to pull that off properly. So we were looking like, how can we meet in the middle, still get some additional information there, but not overflowing them with all that information in the threat trees and in a very systematic approach. So a couple of years ago, we introduced the uh, Linden Go cards, which is a more lean approach to applying basically the same knowledge, but it's, um, I, I have a deck here. <laughs> um, but uh, so it has uh, some guidance questions to help you think about what um, is a threat about and does it apply to your specific system. Again, in line with Stride, because for Stride, there's also um, a CARTEC elevation of privilege 
uh, game that will is a more gamified version on how to to do that properly. Um, well, we mentioned that there is uh, we noticed that there is uh, that need for people to have like different shades and 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 different shapes and sizes of how to apply threat modeling. So that also triggered us now to revise our foundation once more to get like the basis straight so we can extract um, a very more extensive formal approach, uh, a support for a formal approach to get a more lean approach out of that, but all from the same foundation so we can better um, accommodate uh, the different needs of the different um, privacy threat modeling analysts. So that's up and coming. So stay, stay tuned. Uh, it will hopefully soon be released on the website. Um, Aram, I don't know if you... Uh, yeah, no, you were very extensive. I don't think I have to add anything. Did, did we talk about the difference between privacy and security so far? No, not yet. No, I okay. think it's maybe, an important one. Uh, it's, yes. it's an important to mention that uh, it's sometimes confusing and many people get confused. Well, me and Kim obviously never. Uh, that what, what is like security and what is privacy? Uh, well, there is typically no privacy without security, but the a perfectly secure system could still be have, have threats in terms of privacy. And actually, there is even a category uh, in security and privacy that are contradictory in a way. So having uh, auditability in a, in a system from a security perspective is a great thing. Well, you should have it. Uh, on the other hand, auditability leads to issues in privacy. Uh, so in privacy, you typically want to have deniability. So being able to say, hey, I didn't do that. And if you have perfect security and perfect auditing in place, there is no way that you can. Well, there are ways, but then, then it somehow starts to starts to be in conflict with that uh, category. Uh, that's like the one extreme category, of course, where things contradict each other. But on the other hand, you can, again, have perfectly secure system. Uh, for instance, if you are a dissident uh, in a in a in a, um, a di um, dictatorship country uh, or some oppressed country, and you want to communicate with uh, an agent in the US or in another country, let's say, uh, you could have a perfectly secure system and send perfectly secure messages. But if the government knows that you're sending, just knows the fact that you're sending a message to another country, which is a democratic country, uh, game over. I mean, that, that, that's, that should give you an idea of like, well, that is an example of a privacy issue while it's perfectly secure. So nobody can, can access it. Nobody can read what you're sending, but the fact that they know that you're sending uh, is is an issue. It leaks data, side channel attack. Kim? Yes, yeah. Um, my mind is popping with stuff I want to add, but uh, let's see if I can focus. Um, so the first thing is um, what Aram was mentioning, um, like, well, I have this non-repudiation and plausible deniability. One is a security property, the other is a privacy property. So we have this kind of conflict here. And um, the same for anonymity and confidentiality. People feel like this is a problem. So especially when we talk to security people, they're like, wow, privacy, really? But oh, you make our lives so difficult and we don't like it. And can we please ignore it? Uh, but it it shouldn't be the case. I mean, the the uh, deniability or the the non repudiation and plausible deniability. I still have to come across an example that really is a conflict, even in an online voting situation, where you have a strong need for um, non repudiation about the fact. Well, at least in Belgium and I think in the Netherlands as well, we have to go voting. So we need to have a proof that we voted. Um, so we need that that's something that we need to, to have. But on the other hand, we nobody should be able to, to, to know who we voted for. So we need to have plausible deniability about the actual vote, but non-repudiation about the fact that we voted. So within that same action, you can still have non-repudiation and plausible deniability, but it's it's on on different elements of it. So it can perfectly coexist. And the same also for 
well, yeah, I want strong authentication because I want to hold people accountable. But yeah, also have all kinds of pseudonymous or anonymous credential kind of solutions that will still allow you to at least hold people accountable in case there is a, a specific issue. But in most cases, do it in a more privacy friendly way. So there's always I think so. At least there's always solutions to do it in a more privacy friendly, privacy aware way. It might require you to to rebuild, rethink the system a bit. Maybe you're focusing too much on that. I want to collect data because data is a new gold, the new gold or the new oil or whatever. And that's still a mindset we need to get rid of. But that's a different discussion, probably. Um, but so, yeah, privacy is different than security but it shouldn't conflict security. Um, and privacy is important. Um, if, if you think of you as a, as a user of a system, you as a data subject, then it makes total sense that companies will not use data for different purposes and, and will act in your best interest. Um, but for the, the organization, that mind uh, shift still still needs to happen. But fortunately, we have GDPR and other legislation that really forces companies to to focus on on privacy as well and integrate it properly and by design. Yeah, it's it's funny uh, that you mentioned GDPR because uh, our next question is specifically about that. So obviously, um, for those that do not know what GDPR is, I'll just give a brief explanation, but I'm sure you guys can go much more in depth, but GDPR is basically a general data protection regulation, which is basically the set of laws given by the European Union about around privacy and security in data, um, which all organizations that collect data from uh, people in Europe need to need to follow. Um, and specifically what, what I wanted to ask you is, can you explain how privacy threat modeling relates to GDPR? Uh, and also uh, getting a bit more technical with it, how does it relate to the privacy by design and privacy by default paradigms which GDPR uh, uh, wants to incentivize? Uh, maybe Aram, you can start. Okay, uh, well, like pr actually privacy and, and security, let's call it just threat modeling, security or privacy, I don't know, uh, let's call it privacy and security, threat modeling. It essentially tackles, uh, it essentially solves the, those things from GDPR, as you mentioned, privacy by design, privacy by default, as well as uh, a section on the technical measures and the technical countermeasures. Now, unfortunately, GDPR is a legislation written by legal experts who are creating what they do, but no offense, they have not a single clue about software development. They have not a they, I don't have the impression that they do understand the difference between security and privacy. And just Throwing in this nice word, privacy by design, probably seems uh, cool, but it doesn't mean anything. Um, and so pr privacy by design is a buzzword meant to encourage and uh, require thinking about privacy properties before actually developing the software. Uh, and I, I would say from there on, there are two approaches. Uh, either you go a checklist based approach, which is not a bad idea, but again, checklists may become impossible to manage although you could start always with checklists, or you can actually go and do a privacy threat modeling, uh, which is a mathematical analog for proving by contradiction. So the purpose is to find a contradiction, uh, and then you know, okay, then there is a privacy threat, so this is not okay. And yeah, that, that, that's more or less uh, what I wanted to say, but I, I'm not sure GDPR works, to be honest. Uh, and recently I had a personal experience. I get more and more calls by random people trying to sell me stuff. I always wonder where the hell do they get my phone number? So I did a Google search and apparently there, there is this firm called Rocket something, Rocket Launch, Rocket Space. Um, well, it's a firm who sells data. It gives it even free uh, data of uh, everybody who is leading an organization. And they had like, all my phone numbers across the years that I ever had. And I've searched more. Uh, and apparently the Luxembourg data protection authorities have flagged those guys already. Uh, and I've said, yeah, they are in violation of the GDPR, but we're not going to do anything about it. That, that's my personal experience with the legislation. Ideally, though, threat modeling 
solves that right? is the thing that you should use to to make sure that you're I don't want to say compliant, but to make sure that you play by the rules. Yeah, yeah. So Adam mentioned it before. It, it has like this one sentence saying you need to implement appropriate technical measures, but to determine what are appropriate technical measures, and it's it's very vague. So that's where where threat modeling is really really useful. Um, I I do want to add. I I don't know if I remember the 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 quote by heart, but I I, I uh, read somewhere. Uh, recently that privacy is uh, not a legal implication uh, a legal obligation that has technical implications but it's actually a data problem that has legal um, implications so the idea is the goal is to build a secure and a privacy aware system and to force people to do it now you have gdpr and other legislations that well yeah that kind of force you and if you don't do that then there might be a fine or or some consequence whatsoever. So what the I'm I'm an academic, so I can be idealistic. But the the whole idea is that an organization should ideally have that that general culture of wanting to do it in a secure and privacy friendly way, anyways. And and by doing that, that compliance part is basically kind of covered and that's much better than just tackling it from the the checkbox compliance kind of way where you say well okay let's see privacy okay check because i have some consents for newsletters and and i i updated my privacy policy and look i found this obscure pet that we implement at the end of our life cycle so we have some pseudonymization of some of the data it's really implementing it at the core of the system and, and at the foundation. But that being said, well, people are typically still looking for GDPR compliance and and indeed threat modeling there is a, is a great step because it's also risk-based, similar to GDPR, which has like a lot of times, I don't th- I think it was 75 times, I don't know, I think we counted it once. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's really risk-oriented, same as 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 threat modeling, but then from a technical perspective. Yeah, no, thank you. So, so yeah, from this we obviously see. I mean, organizations are being kind of forced to to be more to be more privacy aware and to do privacy threat modeling in order to comply uh, with GDPR, um, which also asks for the need, I guess, for more people that are capable of doing privacy threat modeling, right? So our next question is actually a bit related with that. It's, it's related with a, with more of it, of uh, the career path that is a privacy threat modeling. So just, just as a question, w- would, for example, I be able to become a privacy threat modeler? Um, is it a real job or is it usually a, an activity you do within other roles? So you're, for example, you're the security officer and you will do privacy threat modeling as one of the activities or are there people that actually dedicate themselves uh, maybe I know academically uh, it is the case but maybe within an organization are there sometimes people that are 100% just the ones that do uh, privacy threat modeling Um, and in general what does the career path of someone that wants to do privacy threat modeling look like? I I would say that typically uh, a security champion would take that role. Uh, software architects could also uh, add the threat modeling to their belt. Um, and uh, yeah, everybody can threat model, like we said in the beginning. Um, and, and it's absolutely a real job. But I, I think that it, it's like a responsibility that falls within the role of a security champion or a security expert that does also other things uh, along with that. Um, in terms of where, where to start, um, you could you could go and, uh, and 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 do some research work or or do a PhD at Distranet, and then you're ready to go. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. We are always looking for more people, so if you're interested, please come join us. Um, yeah, but but basically. Um, I, I think it's part interest as well. Um, the the background Aram mentioned is important. Um, in addition to the security engineer, a privacy engineer, of course, if you're thinking about privacy threat modeling, 
Um, and I kind of lost my train of thoughts here. Um, but but yeah, basically anybody can do it. Um, and and I, you said like, does is it a designated role? It depends on the organization. If it's a, a big organization, then probably it can be. Um, I know there are some consultancy firms who focus specifically on bringing uh, threat modeling um, to to companies. So of course, obviously, if you work there, then you will be a full time threat modeler. But yeah, it depends to answer as a lawyer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and and as you mentioned, for example, uh, in in the case of big organizations, usually you would have yeah more designated people uh, to do privacy threat modeling. Probably have much more capabilities when it comes to privacy threat modeling. However, uh, our next question is actually, for example, if you have a young startup, a small company, uh, which obviously has uh, much more limited resources, um, wh where should you start if you're if you're aiming to do privacy threat modeling? Maybe you're a small software company that needs to do it. So where should it uh, should you start when it comes to privacy threat modeling? And for example, in what what in, in general, what should your priorities be when it comes to to modeling privacy threats? Well, uh, from my perspective, unless <clears throat> unless you are developing security and privacy specific products, and unfortunately, you, you you have to forget about any threat modeling and any security. You should survive first. So that, that's a bit of a somber view uh, on things for startup, at least. Um, if, if you are developing security and privacy specific products, uh, you should just call Codific and we'd be happy to assist you. <laughs> well, no, joking aside, you can, you, you should go and, and do a threat modeling training. Uh, many conferences organize those, uh, like I mentioned, Black Hat, OWASP conferences, Uh, this is like it's a regular event that pops up uh, virtually anywhere on the planet. Um, I, I would say the biggest names are Adam Shostak and Sebastian de Leersneder. Uh, they are often organizing uh, trainings. I think it's a one day training. It will give you a jump start and then you can read books. You could do as, as a startup, you could do it. I, I would say if you have a limited budget, you don't really have to call an expert, but then your Fed model quality would be not best. But again, It's good to have, it's better to have a, a, a bad thread model than have no thread model at all and not, not do thread modeling at all. You can also read a, a, a lot of books that those guys have published. Um, and there, is quite some, there are quite some resources uh, on YouTube if you want to learn more about thread modeling. Yeah, But well, in terms of security, I, I, yeah, it, it's a good idea to, to start from thread modeling, to do thread modeling. I have to add some nuance to the answer because you kind of said ignore privacy. That's maybe a bit too strongly put. Um, no, no, I didn't say ignore. <laughs> the problem is you have limited resources and then if you are, you need to release a product and typically you're not going to focus on anything about security and privacy. That's yeah, the reality. Well, I'm not saying you should. Yeah I, yeah, I think at least ask yourself the question, when you are processing personal data do i really need it all can i minimize it a bit because if you think of of like well all the personal data you're collecting you're responsible to keep it safe to keep it secure and to to not abuse it so whenever anything goes wrong when there is a breach when you share it with too too much uh third parties or whatever it 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 will have well You might be fined, people will sue you. There might be really personal damages there, depending on the impact um, of, of the information. So it might sound like, how well, who will find this tiny startup? But at least if you consider, do I really need it? Can I maybe change my idea a bit so that I can reduce the personal data I collect? That's like the first step there. And then if you have time, look at Linden. Well, I think it, it, it is useful to at least get that basic understanding of security and privacy, that at least you have somebody who is knowledgeable about the basics there. Um, 
and and yeah go from there and you can extend into a a full threat modeling program that is integrated in in the development life cycle or or, or in the the company structure there yeah i i agree actually yeah <laughs> thank you for that kim at um, least thinking about not collecting data that you're not going to need or okay. yeah not collecting data, even if you think I, I might need this in the future, uh, is a great idea. You are not then you reduce your liability in a way. Yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, keeping focus on on a startup uh, to finish off, uh, this question is definitely going to be more for Aram, but then maybe afterwards, Kim, you can also give your opinion on on whatever uh, Aram answers. So. To finish it off, uh, how do CodiFix applications use privacy threat modeling? I, I thought the definition of a startup is is a company that loses money. I don't think we're a startup. We're fair, actually fair, fair. Cash flow positive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, good question. So now this is where the realities come in. Uh, like we said so far, threat modeling, uh, you should do it before you start developing a system. Um, we, st we kick on threat modeling when we have started already a little bit with the system. So threat modeling, you don't have to do it in a waterfall approach. You can also do it in, in, in your agile sprints. And this is what we do. So before some of the sprints, uh, we, we kick in some threat modeling sessions, which are scoped. So they are relatively limited. They are boxed in time. Um, and then basically we have, we create a diagram, a data flow diagram of the system. And then we've opened the floor for finding any issues, any problems, and any and all the findings go to a list. Um, and after that, then we start prioritizing that list and saying, okay, this stuff we're not going to look at, and these are things which we're going to solve now, or this, and these are things which we're going to solve later. Um, on the other hand, I have to also say that many of our team members have a security background; they go regular to regular security trainings. So everybody's almost all the time running threat modelings in their head. I'm not saying that you should do this. This is not okay. But still having a, a high security awareness in the team will also make sure that, and this is what something we do, uh, we'll also make sure that they will come with threat just out of, just like that, without doing an actual threat modelling exercise. Uh, but still, it's, it's, I mean, you should start the first one and then get the other one or, or vice versa. Um, that, that's how we uh, that's how we do threat modeling. Um, we typically do security threat modeling. Privacy is some we don't our, our applications we are not in the role of the data controller, so we don't control what data should be processed. We do use minimi data minimization principles, uh, so we don't we don't collect anything that's not necessary. If that is necessary, then it comes from the data controller. So we, do, we don't have any liabilities there. Okay, well, obviously I cannot say anything about what Kdifik does. I, I do want to compliment the fact that you have such a, a, a broad basis that all, all employees have that, that security and privacy reflection and awareness. So I think that's a really important thing to get that, that security and privacy culture in there. Um, just a, a side note, because we have been talking about threat modeling, and I think we mainly focused here on greenfield projects. So when you start with building a, a, a system, a product, you um, integrate threat modeling there. That doesn't mean that when you already have a system up and running, you're all lost. Of course, you can also still threat model that one. You have lots more information even there. And you can use the threats you have identified there for the next iteration. Um, there is this one quote by, I think, Avi Duggan and, and Steve Wierix who say, um, the sooner the better, but never too late. So it's always a good time to do threat modeling, basically. Just get started and, and, and extend uh, your, your practice there. Yeah. Um, okay, well, that was all the questions uh, I had. Uh, before I stop the recording, I just wanted to give you guys the floor if you want to do maybe any final concluding remarks around privacy threat modeling, why it's important, uh, and why maybe yeah you should think about applying it, if you do have any. <laughs>
No, I, t- I don't because I think I, I said everything I wanted to say already so far. So. Yeah, I, I think we basically covered it all. So maybe just saying privacy by design is important and it requires you to, to integrate privacy in a systematic way. And threat modeling is a great, great approach to help you do that. Um, so, yeah, have a look and just get started. To, yeah, everybody can be a threat modeler. And it's going to save you money <laughs> yes. on the long run. Yes. On the long run. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's a good place to end. That's a concluding remark. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) So it's going to save your organization uh, quite some quite some money in the long run. Perfect.